What's up, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Falcons Final Whistle Podcast. I'm Scott Baer, alongside Ashton Edmonds and Tori McElhaney, coming to you from Mercedes-Benz Stadium. The roof has been closed, the sun has gone down, and the Falcons have ultimately lost their Week 9 matchup, 20-17 to to the Los Angeles Chargers. What a shock. This was another dramatic one. Um, this is <laughs> The sarcasm was very heavy. <laughs> I mean, it all but... All but two games have been uh, one score, yeah. have come down to the end. Last week against Carolina, they emerged victorious from one of these tight ball games. Mm-hmm. This time they did not. We are going to break down exactly what happened, what went right, what went wrong for the Falcons, including going over uh, their running game. The really stark difference between the first and third quarters for the Falcons and the second and the fourth. Um, we're going to dive into their defense, some third down conversions. Uh, We are obviously going to talk about that. Two crazy turnover sequences kind of back and forth, especially when Austin Eckler fumbles. Taquan Graham picks it up, loses possession, and that sets up the game-winning field goal. Uh, So we're going to get into all that. And, of course, as we like to do, put this thing in big-picture perspective. Yeah. Capital J journalism. Capital J journalism. Actually, that's more of – that's not like journalism. That's more of just like – talking (laughs) (laughs) about what is (laughs) yeah i I feel like about to happen well well tori give me some capital a analysis about what you thought of how this game played out um and how we ended up at a final result that was unwelcome for the home team yeah i think the word that i would use to describe this game was frustrating i think it was a very frustrating game and i think it honestly i i felt just as frustrated watching this game as i did watching last sunday's game for almost the same reasons. And I'll say this, it, it, the, the defense is still having issues getting off the field on third down. That is what they are still having issues. The offense, what I will say about the offense, I know last time on the podcast I talked about the need for the Falcons offense to start quicker. They did that. However, they did not sustain that through four quarters, which I know that we're going to talk about. And and then, of course, you have Young Waiku missing a, a 50-yard field goal, which I know is 50 yards, but we've seen him make those in the past, and you, he, he's become this reliable figure. And so I, th- well, I was very frustrated in, in the fact that the Falcons had every opportunity, I think, to win this game. And instead of having every opportunity to win this game and still somehow pulling it out like they did against Carolina, that's not what we saw happen here. And it w- it was something that I thought that the Falcons just really had moments of not executing on offense, defense, and special teams. And it was the accumulation of all three of those mm, misadventures, if you will, that kind of brought you to a last-second field goal to win it for the Chargers. Ashton, what did you think of – Everything that went down in the fourth quarter, they, I believe the Falcons took a lead into the fourth. Does that sound correct to anyone else? I know it was 17 all with like five minutes left to go. Right. Yeah. So yeah, it was 17, 14 late in the third quarter. So they oh, yeah, they did. took it's a like slim a lead. lead. Yep. Um, your thoughts on, on what happened in the fourth quarter and where things broke down? Yeah, honestly, the offense just wasn't executing at all. Um, I think Mariota, he threw a lot of incomplete passes, a lot of deep throws uh, to Kyle Pitts, to um, Drake London. You know what I'm saying? Uh, It was just a lot of things on offense that that wasn't working. Um, The defense, again, I I feel like the defense was doing okay, um, but they they weren't executing at all. They, you know, Justin Herbert was throwing a lot of short passes that resulted in a lot of chunk yardage. Um, I feel like Joshua Palmer, he had – uh, a big day. He was open, you know, majority of the game. Um, I think he had over 100 receiving yards. So that really hurt the defense a lot. Um, but I, I just think late in the fourth quarter, you know, we didn't see that consistency that we saw in the first quarter translated to the fourth quarter. I, I just think the Falcons didn't finish through four, four quarters. Here's here's a wild thing, and I'm trying to do math while I'm recording this so it never goes well. Uh, Marcus Mariota threw 11 incompletions. And if I'm counting correctly, nine of those 11 incompletions were targeting Kyle Pitts and Drake London. Mm -hmm. Kyle Pitts, two receptions, 27 yards on seven targets. Drake London, three receptions for 23 yards on seven targets. That's inefficient to your best targets, guys who you would think. Now, of course, you're probably more likely to throw them 
a lower percentage ball, thinking that those guys are going to make a play. Ultimately, those guys didn't make a lot of plays or weren't in sync with their quarterback yeah. in a way that could have been more impactful. I think, too, like this is something that has come up a lot. It's not the Falcons – lack of throwing the ball they're not going to throw the ball 40 times in a game but it's not necessarily the the lack of thought to throw the ball it's the lack of execution when they do throw the ball and that is something that has come up time and time again over the course of the first nine weeks of this season it's a problem an issue that the Falcons if they want to be competitive and, and win some of these games like this one it's something they gotta fix yeah and it, it was a great stat I read in Nerdy Birds, which you can find on Fridays, uh, written by John Dayton and Matt Haley. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think a stat that wowed me is that they run into heavy boxes, which is eight or more individuals in the box, and and NFL high 46% of the time going into this game. The reason why I bring that up and is just to try to say the way that you – keep defenses honest right is being able to not only throw but convert those deeper shots it was something that they did better against Carolina it's something that they didn't do very well here and I think ultimately it was costly Tori and I the the running dialogue during the game needs to be on a Twitter space or something <laughs> like that we said someone should give us a headset during the game yeah and just just to hear our ramblings but then I was like maybe don't do that yeah yeah uh, <laughs> Tori and Scott and Ashton unfiltered. Maybe that's a bad idea. Uh, uh, yeah. Nonetheless, um, th- just that if, if they're not staying on schedule yeah. with a productive first down, if they fall behind early, it's hard for them to convert with the way that this passing game is going. That's yeah. something, a point that I think Tori has brought up a number of yeah. different times. And I think it showed up here during this game that when they were able to get – Three plus again. This is your number. Not it's, <laughs> this is not my idea. I want this to be very clear. I'm regurgitating the smartness from Miss McElhaney. Are we all clear on We're that? Clear. Okay, <laughs> cool. Uh, I but, appreciate the credit. <laughs> but I uh, but I think that it's a good point, and I think that until they get this passing game to become more efficient, yeah. it's going to be harder for them. You know, to to because sometimes you have to make off schedule plays. Yeah. Sometimes you're gonna have, like the Chargers did, first and twenty five, and they convert. You have to be able to to do that, not because sometimes everything won't go perfect. Does anyone and understand what I'm saying? No, no, yeah. you're I feel right. like I'm losing myself. No, no, no. And another point that I would make: you're gonna have teams that are gonna load the box to take the run away. When you have a guy like Tyler Algier who is running at a clip where he is averaging 9.9 yards a carry. That is a true 9. story. 9.9 yards a carry, people. Is that when, good? When he <laughs> is doing that, you're going to have teams that are going to load the box. You have to be able to take some of that pressure off of the run game. And I think it goes back to also running the ball is not a problem no. here. It is, the Falcons ran for 201 <laughs> yards. Rushing today. 5.7, a clip, two touchdowns. On that the is a wild number to lose the game. And so I I really am sitting here kind of – I go back to the whole frustrating thing, uh, that what I said at the top. It's like with this offense, and I think this is something we talked about actually in the Bengals' loss, where it's like ha- is there a formula for – defending the Falcons offense and I think it's interesting because I asked Marcus Mariota about the the three and out in the fourth quarter the 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 with five minutes to go in the game where they ran the ball on first down he takes a deep shot to Kyle Pitts it's an incompletion and then I can't remember what that they threw an incompletion on third down Mm -hmm. and then punted right and he was talking about that play that whole sequence Uh, in a nutshell, and he kind of said, you know, they go to the pass on second down because they load the box and you try and get some pressure off of your running backs and your offensive line, so you try and hit hit Kyle Pitts deep and you don't hit him. And I feel like that probably happened more times than not when you're looking at, you know, those targets that you were talking about to Drake London and Kyle Pitts. How How much of that is to set up what the Falcons can do in the run game? I feel like for years we've been talking about how the pass is set up by the run 
And mm-hmm. I feel like now we have switched that in this year where it's like the pass has to set up the run because right now the run is the one thing that is consistently successful for the Falcons this year. Yeah. And when I kind of look at it, I look – if they can solve that problem, and they don't have to be, you know, the run and shoot no. or anything, right? They don't but have to throw the ball 35, 40 times They can times throw the ball 23 times yeah. and be just fine. Totally. They just have to be more efficient with it. Yep. And I think that if they can solve that problem, this offense could be really good. Yeah. We've uh, seen them. We've seen that, you yeah, know? Th- during individual drives, you will see those moments where they connect on a pass and they're consistently running the football and you're like – that's how it's supposed to look. Yeah. Because this, this offense is, I mean, Arthur Smith. It, it's well coached. <laughs> yeah. And it's well orchestrated on game day. And he comes with a good plan. But if, so if the, exec- if the execution can improve just a little bit, I think a lot of these other problems that we're talking about that are being exposed aren't that big of a deal. I think maybe not everything has to be a last-minute de- uh a last-minute thing. Question is, can they do it? Right. Um, and that's the real issue. Mm-hmm. Um. So when it comes to the running game, that's in a good spot. We've identified, you know, kind of what the issues were. In this game in particular, Ashton, you look at the first quarter, Falcons dominated. You look at the third quarter, they were better. Second and fourth did not go well. And Arthur Smith, um, uh, talking about the difference between the first and the second quarter, said we certainly allowed them to go back out there as we – uh, you feel like that you have the momentum, you get them on the ropes a little bit, but that's the NFL. We have to find a way, and we'll continue to do that as they get back to work. Finding that consistency. That's another one of these themes, right? Mm-hmm. This team is both inconsistent in games and between games, right? it seems like. You know, um, how do you know, like, how do you, I guess, how do you solve that is a terrible question, but how much <laughs> of an impact is inconsistency and was inconsistency in this game? Yeah, I mean, I, I go back to what Tori said. Um, I, I think those misplays was the determining factor in this game. Um, I, I, the Falcons, they definitely have to stay consistent. I mean, you know, when they start for, when they start fast and they and they execute in the first quarter, I feel like you know that brings some type of momentum to the Falcons' offense and defense. I think the defense executed well, also in the first quarter, uh, limiting Justin Herbert, limiting Eckler on a run. Um, but those inconsistent quarters, the second and fourth quarter, that's what hurt the most. And you can't let a quarterback like Justin Herbert get hot. You can't let uh, a running back like uh, Eckler find, you know, open holes or um, run a deep route or, or catch a short pass that, that might result in a 20-yard gain from Herbert. The Falcons have to limit those specific things. And, and I think if we're going to contend for a playoff spot or continue to stay atop of the NFC South, we have – to, to clean up those things. You know what's a wild stat is uh, if you look at I, – I have it pulled up, so I'm going to read it. Sweet. In the first quarter, Atlanta had 145 yards and scored 10 points. The Chargers had 16 yards and scored no points. Then it was completely flipped on its head in the second quarter. The Falcons had negative five yards in the second quarter, no points. The Chargers had 166 yards and scored 14 points. Wow. Wow. That is, when you look at that stat, just without any other context at all, that is wild to me how you could go from so hot to so not it, <laughs> in w- the span of like one one to two quarters. And this wasn't like a halftime break where somebody no. made some adjustments. It was just the clock struck zero, the quarter number changed, and then we kept going. Yeah. It, it's it was crazy to me. And I, I think even kind of looking at uh, this was something, this was an idea that I wrote about post game. Something that kept coming up when I was talk when we all were talking to players and coaches and et cetera, et cetera. They kept saying, like talking about the ebb and the flow of a game and how there's always going to be an ebb and a flow of the game. And I, I, I think we can all agree on that. Mm-hmm. However, when the Falcons ebb, it, it's, it's a big ebb. Mm-hmm. I, don't know, <laughs> I don't know how else to describe it, but it's like the ebb of the entire second quarter put them in a position to where you're going into the third quarter, and even though you play better in the third quarter, you ebb again in the fourth quarter, offensively and defensively, and it's almost like these ebbs are 
creating situations that make it more difficult for the Falcons to flow offensively and defensively. They are at their best when they are kind of flowing, where it's not terrible, it's not fantastic. They're just kind of moving the ball. They're coming up with some key stops, even if they they have defensive drives that last the full length of the, the field or 20 to 20. When they start ebbing and when they start getting in these negative yard situations and giving up 166 yards and 14 points in one singular quarter, that is where the ebb becomes almost insurmountable. Right. Tidal wave style. Yeah. Where it, it just kind of hits you and knocks you back and can you recover? And the Falcons ultimately did recover for a while. And we're going to get to, I'm sure, what everybody wants to hear about. And that is uh, the... Austin Eckler fumble recovered by Taquan Graham, which was he dropped the football as he was uh, trying to get a big return, yeah. set up a big play for his team. Um, Ashton wrote about this. Um, Ashton, we're going to go over some of the quotes uh, that Arthur Smith and Taquan Graham said because I know this is a flashpoint for fans. Be- before we do that, can we just all have like a gen have, have like a genuine human moment here? Taquan Graham as we all have gotten to know him over the last two years, is just a genuinely good dude yeah. who cares and wants to make plays for this team and and, and does. is a good football player yeah. and a heavy contributor on a defensive line, as Tori pointed out before we started recording defensive line stats. Um, they're not showing up on your fantasy team, and it's they're like, not something that you're going to tangibly yeah. notice, especially with the way the Falcons play their defensive front. Okay, yeah. So we, we have to deal with this singular negative – moment in his season but I did not want to dive into it one we're not blaming him for anything no nope. two his contrib- his positive contributions in this game and really throughout the course of this season must be noted and I- they greatly outweigh this one moment that he had in my opinion right so all those things being said Ashton uh, what was the post-game conversation first from Graham um, and then for Arthur Smith the head coach who uh, really stood up for his good young player yeah, for sure. I'm, Graham honestly was in was in great spirits. You know what I'm saying? He his head wasn't down. Um, he wasn't sad. You know, he was the the gist of what he was saying is, you know, I have to move on from this situation. This football, the ball slipped. Um, you know, he really wanted to make a play, but the ball just came out, and you know, he couldn't really do anything about it. Um, Arthur Smith was extremely proud of Taquan, and, and the quote from Arthur says, "I back TQ 100,000 percent. He wanted to make a play." It's a funny shape the ball, but I love TQ. He should never hang his head down. He scooped the ball up and it slipped out. He's a defensive lineman and the ball takes funny bounces sometimes. And I, I just think, you know, TQ, he's going to learn from this moment. This was his first um, NFL uh, fumble recovery. And, you know, he just – he even joked and he said maybe switch out the leather palm gloves to, to stickies maybe. He, he even said that after the, after the game. So I think, you know, Taquan isn't – he's not going to dwell on something like this. Um, he felt like he contributed to the loss, but we all know he didn't. Um, well, I mean, he he definitely he contributed did, yeah. to the loss. Okay. But, yeah, but I wouldn't say that that's the sole that reason. Was, yeah. yeah, right. That's true. Um, but I would just, all in all, I would just say TQ was, was in great spirits after the game, and it's something that he looks to build upon. Yeah. I'll say this, too, about TQ, and um, it goes back to kind of what Scott was saying. When we were talking about it, I, was, I, I did say, you know, if a defensive lineman isn't getting a sack, it's like it, – it, in the eyes of people, I think, sometimes watching the games, it's like, oh, well, they didn't do anything. I never heard their name called, so they didn't do anything. But with that position particularly, and I think Dean Pease has talked about this a lot, is like they are contributing to a lot of different factors – as just getting the quarterback off their spot. And I think that we have, over the course of the, these first nine games, we've seen, I think, the Falcons' defensive line be better at doing that in comparison to what they did last year. I think last year it was a huge issue that they that the quarterbacks were just way too comfortable in the pocket against this defense. I feel like at, at this point now, even against Justin Herbert, who I did feel like played, you know, fairly well and and there were moments that I think he did maybe have too much time in the pocket but I do think that you were seeing this defensive line get after quarterbacks in a, in a, at a better rate than not uh but before TQ and for what he's been to the Falcons this year I mean you think about just how the Falcons let go of Tyler Davidson in the offseason right they 
think that they're going to go into the 2022 season with Grady Jarrett, Marlon Davidson, kind of hoping that Marlon Davidson was going to get a, a have a good, healthy year for them. And then you have TQ kind of acting as your reserve guy. And, and Vincent Taylor. Vincent Taylor, who you get off the street, who – you would think was coming off of an injury, was really excited to get out there, someone who could provide depth for you. That was your core of defensive line. And Anthony Rush. And Anthony Rush. That was your core of interior defensive linemen. And now you look at where this group is nine weeks into the season, and TQ and Grady Jarrett alongside each other have been such an important part of what this defense is is doing when they are successful. And you look at Anthony Rush is no longer here. Marlon Davidson is no longer here. Obviously, Tyler Davidson is no longer here. He was let go in, in, before the season even started. Vincent Taylor got hurt. All of these names, you now have Abdullah Anderson and Jalen Dalton, who was just elevated from the practice squad. Like, all of these names, and, and even in all of this change and everything, I th- feel like TQ has been a solid contributor from the from week one to where we are at week nine, and I I don't want I say all this to say like I don't want people. I'm, yes, he should ha- not have fumbled the ball. We can all agree on that. He would agree on that. Everybody would agree. You have to hold on to the ball in that situation. And that it was costly. And that it was costly. But I will say this: I hope people don't take this one moment and kind of have it ruin what TQ has been for this defense over the course of these nine games is what essentially – and what he could be for defenses down the road. Yeah, 100%. Um, so let's set the magnifying glass aside, take the eye off of the microscope, and try to go big picture here. Uh, we are recording this in the late 7 o'clock hour on Sunday. As we have been recording, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers came back and beat the Los Angeles Rams. Did they really? Wow. Now they, they now have the same record – as the Falcons at four and five, technically because of the of a head to head, you you'll see Tampa Bay on top of the division. Carolina lost badly to Cincinnati. Cincinnati will make a lot of teams look bad. <laughs> and you have the New Orleans Saints coming up. Their record, which was just in front of me, their record is three and five. They play the Baltimore Ravens on Monday night. So as we as we look at this from a higher perspective, and I wrote a column about this is that, look, this wasn't a division game, but this was a winnable game mm-hmm. that the Falcons didn't win. Mm-hmm. And they're three and four in one-score games. They were seven and, and, and two last year. That's not a translatable thing between year to year, so the experts tell me. But nonetheless, <laughs> when you have an opportunity like the Falcons had today with a couple of better results on critical downs, offense, defense, and special teams, this outcome is different. Yeah. Just is. Mm-hmm. And you cannot let opportunity slip or you're going to get to early January with some with some regrets. Mm-hmm. And the Falcons cannot afford to let opportunity slip away. You won't have an opportunity every week. Sometimes you'll dominate. Sometimes you're going to get dominated. It's the league. It's the way that it, it is. Losing out on this golden opportunity is hurtful, I think, to their quest to win the division, which – Whatever, I get it's week 10. They are playoff contenders, meaning they are a contender for a playoff spot. Let's get the definition very clear. <laughs> yeah, right, okay? yeah. <laughs> they are playoff contenders to win this division. They have to do better when they are given opportunities like this when they are in games and they have a chance to get a W and maybe start seriously stacking wins. Mm-hmm. This goes back to the consistency problem yep. that they've had, and it showed up again today. M- maybe some people might say they got a little lucky against Carolina. I think they made one more play than Carolina did. Mm-hmm. Their kicker is pretty good, <laughs> right? So so I, I think that when you add it all up, you can't continue to let these opportunities slip at this rate and mm-hmm. expect to be standing atop this division. Yep. Um, that's where I think they stand. Of course, they have a huge – if every game matters, as Alameda Zacchaeus pointed out to me, every game matters. Division games matter even more. Mm. And, the, and they have that Thursday night game. Kind of, Tori, we're, 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 we're at the pivot point in, yeah. the, in the season. We can say that we're heading into the second half of the year. Evaluate maybe kind of where the Falcons are. Like maybe nobody expected them to be in this division yeah. race. But here they are. If, if they do the right things, they, which they can control – 
they could win this whole thing. Yeah, I I, I think it's really I, I look at this. I don't want to get too far ahead and start right. speculating too far ahead. But if you are just looking at this Thursday night game coming up against Carolina, it's a big game for many reasons, but mainly for I mean for just the NFC standings, right. a, NFC South standings. I'm sorry. You look at what Tampa Bay just did against beating the Rams. Mm-hmm. You look at what the Saints have an opportunity to do on Monday night. Maybe maybe we know by the time you're listening to this what right. they do on Monday night. You, But then you look at the Falcons, and, and it really does feel like in this division, because of the way that the league is kind of playing right now, that every team kind of has their destiny in their hands. You know, you, you, I, I really do feel that way because it is kind of the old saying on any given Sunday, like anyone can beat anyone. And I feel like more than ever, these last few years have really been – dictated by that old cliche and and so for that reason Thursday night's game the more the more division wins you get the easier it is for you to get a playoff berth and Mm -hmm. that's just how it is so because of all that this is a very very important game on Thursday night it's going to be very interesting to see how the Falcons bounce back on a short week it's also going to be very interesting to see what changes both teams make after playing each other what 10 days ago, right? 10 that is going to be – it is a quick turnaround. It is very fascinating, I think, to, to see – because it almost becomes like a, a coaching chess match right. when, you ha- when you have two teams that know a lot about each other, especially recent knowledge of each other. Um, I think getting Cordero Patterson back – this time around may make a difference in terms of what the Falcons can do offensively. I think that that is kind of advantage Atlanta. But an advantage for Carolina is that we don't know who the heck's going to be under center for them. Yep. It could be Baker Mayfield. It could be P.J. Walker. It literally could be <laughs> either of the two <laughs> at any point in time during four quarters of the game. We don't know that. So that's advantage, I think, Carolina. There is so many storylines that are going into this Thursday night game, and the outcome of it, I think, very much dictates where the Falcons go moving forward in their division, just in their division. Right. Yeah, and I think that that's a good way to look at it. It's week 10. Let's not start thinking about the week 18 matchup against Tampa mm. and really hone in on – what's coming up here and Richie Grant called it a must win. Yeah. It's week 10. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but it seems like that's where their head is at. Ashton, let's kind of wrap it up here. Did what were your takeaways from what the guys were saying in in the locker room about moving on from this loss and having a game against Carolina on a Thursday night? Seems like every everybody was just kind of kept harping on the fact that yeah. hey, got to turn the page. Got to turn the page. Yeah. Got to turn the page. That was literally the quote of the night from literally every player, even CQ. Um, they're, not, they're not really harping on this loss. They're looking forward to Carolina, like Tori mentioned. Baker Mayfield might be under center. He had two touchdowns today against the, the Bengals in the last two quarters of the game. Um, you know, player, it's a short week. You know what I'm saying? Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, they got practice. Thursday, they have the game. So they can't really harp on this loss against the Chargers who are not in their division, they have to learn from it and they have to move on and and win this divisional game. This is going to be very uh, crucial and very important on Thursday. And um, I I just think players, uh, you know, they're they're already moved on to Thursday's game. And, um, you know, I I think, you know, this week in practice, how they practice um, and and how they – what they learn from watching this game's film will be critical um, against the Panthers on Thursday. It's interesting, too, because Arthur Smith said in his post-game press conference, he was like, as soon as I leave here, we're moving on to Carolina. And I believe him when he says it. Yeah, 100%. I, I bet uh, as we're recording this on a Sunday night, he is probably at the office or in front of an iPad mm-hmm. watching film, trying to get this team, as Grady Jarrett always says, you cannot let one loss turn into two. That is the Falcons' quest as they move towards Thursday night's game against Carolina. We're going to be in Charlotte. Of course we are. All three of us, as a matter of fact. Yeah. Uh, co- uh, covering this game, a huge divisional game, prime time. Uh, should It should be a fun one. And... We will talk to you after that one, gosh, in just a few days' time. So thank you all for downloading, listening, subscribing to the Falcons Podcast Network. If you haven't done that, do it right now, see who play. (laughs) (laughs) I love that. I've officially lost my mind. So I'm going to get out of here before before I say any more crazy stuff. I'm Scott Ashton. Tori, thank you guys so much. We'll talk to you again after that Panthers game.